Aloha and welcome to the ninth POD podcast. Uh, this will be the seventh AMA or Ask Me Anything uh, edition, and it'll be the fourth with Anders Lux providing most of the questions, technically all of the questions. Uh, so sit back. Uh, hope you enjoy. Uh, let's get right down to it. Here's the first question. What is demonology exactly? Demonology is a branch of ritual or ceremonial magic that deals specifically with the dark arts or black magic of summoning and pacts. As with any branch of magic, one can study this field, practice it, or both. For example, I merely study. Insofar as theurgic angelology invokes from the macrocosm beyond, goetic demonology evokes from the microcosm within. Alistair Crowley put it in no uncertain terms in his introduction to the Lesser Keys of King Solomon Grimoire when he said, The spirits of the Goetia are portions of the human brain. And went on to elaborate, The names of God are vibrations calculated to establish a control of the brain. Establishment of functions relative to the subtle world. B. Control over the brain in detail. Rank or type of the spirit. And C. Control over one special portion. The name of the spirit. Mengele's monarch method of mind control. Establishing a complex of personality alters in a multi-story memory castle, each floor being accessed by a central stairwell or elevator, is a clear evolution from Crowley's understanding of the Goetia, possibly combined with the Golden Dawn's models of the Enochian watchtowers. So we can posit the demonology and pacts being propagandized as the ultimate evil during the Dark Ages, has its similarities to the modern field of mind control, nowadays considered the most evil violation of mental privacy of imaginable. To put it in no uncertain terms for ourselves, demonic magic is equal to mind control. Thus, a curse and a love spell may be indistinguishable to their victim, considering neither is enacted of their own volition, and so both may be considered equally evil. For what it's worth, Crowley also describes how to free oneself from unwanted forms of mind control in his Book of Lies, in poem 47, Windmill Words, where he sums up succinctly his eight lectures on yoga. Next question is, what is the tree of death? As also with the Kabbalistic tree of life diagram, it depends on who you ask. A.E. Wade established a base 10 tree of death with 10 cortices opposite the 10 sephirot emanations on the usual base 10 tree of life diagram. Kenneth Grant of the Typhonian OTO, also provides base 10 models enlisting the orders of demons and devil kings associated with each cortex of weight. Crowley, for his part, provides the Cliffoth Sui Generis as the 22 paths on such a base 10 model in his Liber 22. In his 1996 Magician's Workbook, Volume 2, on Goetic Evocation, Kabbalah scholar Steve Savidow 
posits a different model for a tree of death with only seven cortex vertices and 12 paths or edges. In my own work, I combined these two lattices, the base 10 tree of life model of saved house. In my own work, I combined these two lattices the base 10 tree of life model and save it as base seven tree of death diagram into a new arrangement with 17 vertex corners and some 34 edges or paths. I called this arrangement graphically the Jacob's ladder lattice array in my work and, and in my work, the tree of death and the cliff Oth, I assign all the adverse attribute traits to it of Crowley weight Grant, and save it out. I call these adverse arrays on the Jacob's Ladder lattice the Saint Simon for the evil traits in Hebrew and the blind dragon for the same traits in English. Dualistically, it stands to reason that if there is a tree of life, there must also be a tree of death. But mythically, this is not necessarily the case. In the myth of Genesis regarding the exile of Adam and Eve from Eden, one of the seven curses God places onto mankind and the serpent is that the tree of immortal life that Adam and Eve were given to enjoy in Eden would now be blocked off from them by an angel with a flaming sword, and they would be cursed to only partake of the tree of knowledge thereafter, known in place of it as the tree of life model of the Kabbalah. So in paradise, the model of the tree of life we have now would have signified the tree of knowledge and save it as tree of death array would have signified the original tree of life. What role do angels and demons play in the Enochian communication system? In ancient Enochian literature, there were two classes or ranks of angels. One was the seven archangels who ruled the days of the week and so forth, and the other were the roughly 22 Anunnaki angels, Anunnaki fallen angels who rebelled against God by bearing giant or Nephilim offspring with the daughters of man. These events were outlined briefly in Genesis 6-4, but are given a much more detailed narrative in the books of Enoch. In the Enochian system of magic designed by John D. and Edward Kelly in the late 1500s, there are at least 91 intelligences one can invoke as sigils on the four watchtowers model, and within that model also an array of various other ranks and files of beings tasked with various chores, each capable of being rendered also as a cacodemon by simply reversing the spelling of their name. Any of these angels or demons may be summoned in D's Enochian by reciting its name in its corresponding Call of the Thirty Heirs. The Neo-Enochian works of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, particularly those developed by S.L. Mathers and described with his Concourse of the Forces ideas in the Golden Dawn Manual by Israel Rigardi, have far more to do with decorating each cell of the four watchtowers with a truncated pyramid, independently of each cell's letter, in English or Enochian, and result in a color-coding method for deriving 12 zodiacal attributes by cross-referencing the four terrestrial elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and the three essential phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas, quite removed from the angelology of Dee's original system. Nevertheless, Mather's Neo-Enochian models managed to complement Dee's system of magic as well as these models complement the ancient Enochian Apocrypha. In my own understanding of the Enochian communication system, it is a global energy field associated with Earth's ionosphere in modern scientific parlance. 
that allows over the horizon telepathic communication. That is instantaneous remote viewing, mind reading, and even think talking at extreme distances. Past incarnations of it include what I call the animal internet. Present modes include the cybernetic internet, and future iterations will likely involve augmented reality interface systems. The peaks and valleys of activity in the Earth's ionosphere are a product of space weather created locally by the sunspot cycle, which in turn is caused by interstellar gravity waves emanating from the Milky Way's core black holes. These peaks and valleys of sunspots and ionospheric activity on Earth correspond to the errors of imperial rises and falls in the history of humanity. What are the mechanics of the Enochian communication system? The ECS functions like a global telepathic switchboard, connecting a caller here to an operator there via a servitor, one of the 92 sigils on the four watchtowers. Although its foundation is Earth's ionosphere, it is a far more complex and ever-changing pattern on this background force field that comprises the mechanics of the ECS. If a soul were thought of as being like an individual's toroidal aura, and their mind like the patterns of electromagnetic energy taken around this toroidal aura or over time, then the ionosphere would be the soul or aura of Earth, and the ECS alike its mind. More appropriately, the ECS is like an invisible brain superimposed over the Earth, in which the Schumann resonance frequencies would be its own brainwave states, indeed comparable to our own. Averaged out from the around a, th a hundred lightning bolts that strike the planet per second, being alike the neural electrical engrams inside our own brains. In this sense, our own brains as receivers and transmitters in this system play a role in its mechanics as well. And as climate changes, so shall we adapt and evolve along with it. Overall, the global ECS accesses the galactic Akashic records, which play a similar role of data storage and retrieval on a far larger scale. The intergalactic equivalent is the supersymmetric quantum gravity string connecting the poles of all black holes at the cores of spiral galaxies along the plasma filaments and serving a similar neural network function as well. Although galaxies can take epochs to align, during their alignment, they may be able to transmit pulsed tachyons between them at faster than light speeds. This last question. How can one access the ECS? Are there methods slash techniques? Even in sleep, even as a fetus in the womb, one is never disconnected from the planetary ECS. So nobody on Earth is ever not accessing it, always. While we mechanically broadcast AM and FM radio waves across our planet's ionosphere, this microwave radiation penetrates our brains to stimulate neural activity and penetrates our genetics to stimulate, hopefully adaptive, mutations. However, it is not necessary to understand its mechanics and workings in order to be able to use the ECS. So, just as no one can ever be locked out of the ECS, as they may be their car, home, phone, or bank account, one doesn't need to understand the mechanics of the ECS in order to use it, any more than one needs to be able to understand the mechanics of their car or their phone or the banking system to make use of these. It is in no way necessary to even know the ECS exists in order to exploit it for use in telepathic communication. 
The ECS is simply a mental medium through which emotions, thoughts, and ideas may pass in relative silence from one brain to another. If one does wish to understand the inner workings of the ECS, as one may wish to disassemble their cell phone to explore its hardware and electronic circuitry, one must begin, at least, with the four watchtowers construct of D being a complex model of Kabbalah, associated as such with the double cubit altar of ritual or ceremonial magic by Crowley in his book four. And that's the last question. So I'm going to wrap this episode up and just say for now, thanks for tuning in. And I hope you all have a great day. Peace.